The singleton is the most common game programming pattern, but are you getting the most out of it? Today, I wanna to go all the way from the basic C-sharp singleton through all the variations that I've used right up to the null object singleton. We'll talk a little bit about the null object programming pattern, and I wanna demonstrate some of the new features of C-sharp, such as default interface methods. Lots to talk about today, so let's get into it. So as per usual, let's start with the basics and gradually get more and more advanced. If you need to enforce the constraint that you only need one of something, but you don't need to expose it to the editor, then consider just making a pure C-sharp singleton. You can store the instance in a private field and then expose it with a public property. If the instance is null, when someone goes to fetch it, you can just create a new one and store it there in your private field. To prevent future you or anyone else from just creating a new scorekeeper anywhere, make a private constructor. The way this is set up now, the only way someone can create a new scorekeeper is by calling for the instance. Now, this isn't a whole lot of code, and me personally, I wouldn't move this into a generic type or anything like I'm going to do with the mono behaviors we're about to see. So let's move on and look at something a little bit more complex where you actually want to expose your singleton to the editor. So again, this is so simple that Copilot was able to fill it out right away without any help from me. Unlike the pure C-sharp singleton, here we can hook into the Unity lifecycle. On Awake, we can check if there's already an instance assigned to be the singleton. If there isn't, then this instance becomes the singleton. If there is already one assigned, let's just destroy this game object, and that will enforce the constraint of only having one instance of this type. For me, this is already too much boilerplate. I like to keep three variations of a generic singleton around so I can just hook into that whenever I need one. The simplest of those is just a singleton of type T where T is a component. It's going to, again, have just a static field to hold the instance. Now, I like to keep a few public methods here that come in handy once in a while. Has instance will be able to tell us whether or not the singleton has even been initialized or not. A try get method might be useful in some situations. In the public getter, I'm going to add a little bit more resilience here. We can say if the instance is null, let's use Unity's find any object by type method. This retrieves any active loaded object of type T that exists in any of the loaded scenes. If we still can't find one, then let's just make our own. So we can instantiate a new game object and we can add component of type T to it. I'm just gonna change the name here so that we can see that this was auto-generated. That means we either chose not to place one in our scene or we forgot. Now, if we did place this item in our scene, when the game starts up, the awake method is gonna get called. So then we could initialize the singleton. Now, awake can get called in some situations in edit mode, so we could put a check in here that says, if the application isn't playing, return. Otherwise, let's set instance equals to this as type T. And there we go, we've got a simple generic singleton that hides away all this boilerplate for us. Now, another variation on this is the persistent singleton that doesn't destroy on load. It's almost the same as this, so I'm going to create a new class and just copy and paste this in, and then we can just make some changes here. Now, one thing about don't destroy on load is it only works on game objects at the root level. So I'm going to have a Boolean flag here that will be defaulted to true, that will auto unparent this object. If it was parented, it's a child of something, we want to kick it back up to the root level. So what we can do is when we're initializing, we can say if this flag was true, let's set the parent to be null. Then I'll add one more conditional here. I'm just going to drag this instance assignment up into there, and that's where we'll add our don't destroy on load flag. Now at this point here, we can also say if the instance wasn't null, then we need to destroy this instance. So I would think that up till now, there haven't been too many surprises. What I want to look at next is what I call a regulator singleton. First, I'm just going to copy and paste this persistent singleton code into the regulator singleton. I just called it a regulator singleton because it's self-regulating. What it's going to do is find any older singleton instance or instances that happen to exist and wipe them out so that it becomes the one and only singleton. Now I'm going to make it a little bit leaner. We don't really need to unparent this one because we're the ones going to be instantiating it. We probably also don't need a try get. Of course, you can make these any way you want. They're just examples. I'm going to also add a hide flags to this new game object because I don't want it ever getting saved with the scene. We basically destroyed the one that was supposed to be in the scene and replaced it with this one. 
So to accommodate all of this, what we should do is have each of these singletons keep track of when they were actually created. So with those changes at the top of the class out of the way, let's go down to the bottom here and take care of the real work. So we're done with auto unparent on awake in this class. Let's get rid of that. I'm going to move don't destroy on load out of the conditional here. And I'm also going to, in the same place, set the initialization time. So we can just use time.time .time for that. Now, right before we make the assignment at the end, we're going to search and destroy any other existing instances of type T. So we can just wipe that part right out. Now let's just create a little array and we'll find all the objects of that type. And we can use Unity's newer method here. <laughs> Copilot suggesting the old one, but it's been replaced by this find objects by type. And we can look for type T and then you pass in a sort mode. It doesn't really matter which sort mode we use because we're going to get rid of all of them. Once we've got them all in the array, let's just loop over them one by one. We can say for each T old in old instances, let's get the regulator singleton component, find the initialized time. If that one's initialized time is less than this one's initialized time, we're going to destroy that old one. Then at the end, we make the assignment. We should only have one singleton left in our game. So that one's a little bit different than a lot of people have probably seen before. So this kind of system might be useful if you want to totally swap out one game system for another one at a certain point in your game. Like maybe something's happened where, for example, maybe you're going from your UI to your gameplay. You want to get the UI sound system out and put in the new gameplay sound system. In fact, why don't we make an example just like that of an audio manager. It's a regulator singleton. It's not going to do anything. It's just a dummy class so we can see how it works. And now I'll also make an audio spawner. Now this could be maybe put on a game manager or something, but I don't have a class like that. So let's just make a component that will have a prefab in it. And when I do something like, let's say I press the one key, it will spawn in the new prefab audio manager. Let's go into Unity and see how that works. So let's suppose in my scene here, I've already set up an audio manager. I'll make a prefab out of this so that we can spawn another one. I think maybe what I'll do is give it a different name. Maybe I'll just, uh, I'll call the prefab new audio manager. That way it'll be very clear in the hierarchy when we've done it. Now on the one that's in the scene, let's add the audio spawner here too. And I'll just drag that prefab in. So now when I press play, You'll see that the audio manager, it goes right into don't destroy on load, just like we expect. So it's going to work the way we want. When we want the new one, I'll press the one key and there we go. Got rid of the old one and put in the new singleton. So that's the ins and outs of building a regulator type singleton that will replace what's ever in your game. Basically, the regulator is the inverse of the persistent singleton. The persistent one will destroy any new instances that are made. The regulator one will destroy any old ones that already exist. The last thing I want to talk about today is the null object singleton. Now I'm not going to cover everything there is to know about using the null object pattern in this video, but a null object is often very well represented by a singleton because a null object does nothing. A null object has no state. All of its properties return the same value. All of its methods have no operation. Because of this, we only ever need one of them. Now, here I've implemented a very naive version of the command pattern. I want each of the buttons in my game to have a command, but some of them are empty. So instead of checking these for null every time I click them, I can just put a null command in there. Now, I've defined all my commands. Let's create a little factory that will serve these up. It doesn't have to be anything too special. What we can do is just have a public method here that will create a new instance for us. So we pass in the type we want, it makes a new one and gives it back. We can make another new class that would represent each one of these buttons on the hotbar, and that will need a reference to a command. But we could default it to say the new null command that we have. Now we get a serialized reference to the button itself and set a listener to the on click event that will execute our command and debug a little statement. Then let's also add a method to set and unset these commands. When we unset a command, we just put a new null command in there. Back in our hero, 
just for simplicity's sake, we'll have a list of all the buttons. We'll set the first three buttons. The first one and the third one can be a spell command, and the second one can be an item command. The fourth and fifth buttons on the hotbar will be intentionally empty. Now, just before we jump back into Unity, I'm just going to do a little cleanup here because this is really overly verbose for what we need. The item commands could really just inherit from a base abstract class that just outputs that it's doing something and what the actual type was. So what I'll do instead here is actually just have a virtual method and we could just output the command was executed and the name of the type. And that way, these classes for now, they can just inherit from command and they don't have to do anything except the null command will be special. It will say doing nothing. Now, that's enough of a naive example. You can probably see already how we're going to be generating an unnecessary amount of null commands. We're going to make a new null command every time a button is initialized. And we're also making one every time we unset a button. Back here in Unity, all I need to do is make a game object for my command factory. I'll add the command factory component to that new object. I've already hooked up all my buttons, so I can just press play. So if I click button number one, I can see I've executed a spell, button two, item, button three, again, a spell. Now the empty ones does nothing, does nothing. So that's exactly what I want out of the null object. What I don't want is to be creating a new null object every time. As I start refactoring here, I'm going to be using some features of the C-sharp language that you might not have seen before. These features are only available in the newest versions of Unity, and they're not backwards compatible. One of these features is that we can now have default interface methods. So what does that mean for us exactly? Well, first of all, this command factory, it's so simple, it doesn't really need to live on its own. I could cut it out of there and make it a public static method of the interface. But maybe more importantly than that is I can define my null object here. What I can do is have a public static I command null. It's just a property. We'll set it to be a new null command. Now our null command can become an inner class of the interface. Now that I've got rid of the factory and I've moved my null command into the interface, I can see I've got some red squigglies to take care of. Let's go have a look at the buttons first. Here, instead of new null command, I can say equals I command dot null. I can do the same thing down here. Previously, where I was calling the factory, I can now call I command dot create instead. It's a little bit less verbose. I'll just replace all these buttons here. Now we've done something kind of different. Let's make sure it's working. All I have to do is press play. So now, Factory's working, buttons are working, looks good. Let's make sure that the null object is actually working. Yeah, perfect. So we get a null object singleton represented there every time. We're not constantly creating new objects. There is one more optimization we could do here. Because we can now have default method implementations, we can actually get rid of this base class entirely. We don't need it. Let's just implement the interface. Using these new C-sharp features, we've actually refactored our code to be about 50% less than what it was. I'm going to leave you with one final thought here, and that is the principle of least surprise. Just because you can do something doesn't always mean you should. Many, many Unity developers don't know about these new C-sharp features. And so if you were going to share your code with someone else, they might have no idea what it was that you just did. Not only that, but you're kind of hiding some implementation details within the interface. It's very hard to guess that there would even be something there. A lot of people, even senior developers, wouldn't think to look there. You need to also consider the fact that those techniques are not backwards compatible. So again, think carefully about using these new features. Just because you can doesn't always mean that you should. That's all I've got for you today. I'll see you in the next one.